It's time to take command with former NFL tight end Logan Paulson and former Commander's Beat reporter Craig Hoffman. Take command podcast from Odyssey Sports. I'm Craig Hoffman. That is Logan Paulson. You can catch me on the radio three to six each and every day on the team 980. And you can catch Logan on command center. And of course, uh, his resume, important point, thing you need to know uh, is that he played 10 years in the NFL. Six of them in Washington. And uh, Logan, how many offensive coordinators did you play for in your career? In my career? So I had, um, I had two in college. I had one, two here. I had one in Chicago, Atlanta, Houston, San Francisco. It was the same offensive coordinator. So like eight or nine. That's uh, that's a lot. That's a yeah. lot. Uh, mm-hmm. Commander's going to be going on their second in four years. Obviously, they had... Quite a few before that, uh, Kevin O'Connell, Jay Gruden kind of was acting OC uh, after Sean McVay left and before he elevated Sean. So uh, Commanders fans are certainly no stranger to the OC search. And what we wanted to do today was talk about some of the candidates, uh, especially one who's an actual candidate. There's one that I want to throw in there that I think is super intriguing, but whose name has not come up in their search. Um, But we will also talk about Chris Harris's departure as he looks to be headed out for another job, someone who is probably the most coveted person. I mean, I think definitely the most coveted person on Jack Del Rio's staff in terms of future defensive coordinator uh, type of type of person. So uh, he is he is headed off to be a passing game coordinator, which is kind of like a half a half DC defensive Um, pass game. coordinator. Yeah, yeah. yeah, Defensive pass game coordinator. Um, And so that is uh, something we'll talk about what what his loss means for Washington coming up in just a little bit. But let's start off, Logan, uh, on the OC front with Pat Shermer. Um, He is the favorite, I think, by most reporting for the job. He is someone who has a ton of really high-level OC experience. And I got to say, after talking to my guy, Sean Mraz, on uh, Friday for the show and getting a little bit of insight on his time, even with the Giants, Mm -hmm. I I put him – I push Shermer to the top of my list. Mm. Um, Why? I just, I think that his ability to generate big plays, his ability to utilize personnel well, um, both as like, Hey, we got to get our good players, the ball, but also using their skill sets to have help maximize other guys. And frankly, I think the thing that's most appealing about him is the level of success he's had with mid-level quarterbacks, yeah. Case Keenum, Daniel Jones, you know, rookie version of Daniel Jones. Um, you know, there's been a couple of others throughout his career. I mean, Teddy Bridgewater in Denver, like these guys all had really solid years with Shermer, perhaps some of the best years of their career in Keenum's case, by far and away, the best year of his career, uh, for Jones, the best year of his career until Dable this year. And he's obviously a much more advanced player now as a veteran. Um, but watching that result, knowing that they're either going to be targeting like a mid-level quarterback or working with Howell, who at this point, you know, who knows what he could become, but he's, he's a second year guy will be making his second career start the next time he starts a football game. I think that's really appealing um, to hear and to look at his track record and go, you know, yeah, the head coaching stuff hasn't worked out for him, but as a coordinator, he's shown a level of consistency that is, is extremely appealing with a set of circumstances that is not dissimilar in a lot of ways to what he'll inherit in Washington. Yeah, and I think um, I think all those things are why you get excited about Pat Shermer. I think uh, you know I talked to some of my buddies who've worked with him, and you know one of the things that comes out of those conversations is that he's an excellent teacher. And to me, that's probably I don't want to say the most important thing, but that's a huge factor in terms of me valuing what a coordinator brings because ultimately they have to be able to educate. And um, you know, around the building, a lot of guys on the offensive on the offensive um, side of the ball were kind of like. I don't know if I'm being taught as well as I could. And, you know, that there's a little bit of perception of that. There's a little bit of, you know, record associated with that. But right. I do think everyone that if, thinks that after the record's not very good. Correct. But it also could be true. It also could be true. And I do think that um, you know, a guy like Shermer who's got kind of a, a legacy or a you know, a history of being a good teacher, I think there's value there. And I do think like you said, he brings a lot of um you know, kind of lackluster, like quarterbacks who aren't big names and he's kind of elevated them, which is, I think, what you want. I think, uh, you know, I talked to, like, again, just understanding his offensive philosophy. He's kind of in this Andy Reid tree, you know, of the West Coast where it's more concept driven as opposed to layering runs and passes. You're layering concepts to set stuff up, which I think is kind of an interesting 
uh, dichotomy, you know, kind of compared to what, um, you know, Ron was looking for. But I do think that there is obviously a lot of success with that offense. I mean, Kansas City being, you know, exhibit A, obviously they have a very specific type of, um, you know, skill position group there that allows them to do a lot of very high level stuff. Their offensive line's outstanding. They have the best quarterback in the NFL probably at the moment. So, um, and Andy Reid is one of the best offensive minds in football. So lots of things that kind of make that offense look really good in Kansas City. But he's done a good job of, of, of like you said, elevating guys and uh, kind of executing his vision. And I think there's a lot of value to that. Yeah, definitely. The layering concepts thing is interesting, too, because ta- when, when Mraz was, uh, was talking about Shermer on – Friday with me, he talked about how he would, you know, take three to four yards in the first quarter to set up a big play later. Right. And they would do things that, you know, we see like the the Hayden Hurst touchdown in the Cincinnati game this weekend where they they sneak him out, uh, where they use Jamar Chase as a kind of a decoy on a fake uh, a fake bubble. And mm-hmm. things like that is the type of stuff that Shermer does pretty frequently um, from what Mraz was saying and, and from what, you know, the statistics and everything suggests. I know you've had a chance to watch a little bit of film and, and do all that kind of stuff and obviously talk to some people that with him. But when you talk about layering concepts, it's stuff like that where it's like, we're going to get you to think that we're doing this thing that we do all the time. And then at some point in the game, we're going to hit you with the counter. And at yeah. some point, we're going to use, you know, whether it's Terry or Jahan or Curtis or, you know, all these weapons here, and we're going to get your eyes going right and we're going to sneak somebody out left. And so, Guys like Darius Slayton had big years in New York as a rookie. He was a fifth round rookie at the time. Mm-hmm. Not the Darius Slayton we know now, again, as a veteran, but like he he would get big plays off of them diverting the defense towards Odell Beckham Jr. And mm-hmm. Beckham, by the way, still had a thousand yard season. Right. So it's not like your stars don't get fed. Um and I think he missed a couple games that year as well. So their ability to generate big chunk plays is exactly what I think Rivera wants. So, like, it's a philosophical fit. It is a historical fit. It's a resume fit. Um, and then if he's a good teacher, then even if he's having to switch systems, if they're going to a more of a West Coast-based system versus keeping some of the terminology and um, the Air Coriel principles that we talked about on the last podcast, how some of these things are taught a little bit differently, where, like, maybe it's the same, same route combination, but the coaching points uh, move the route uh, you know, a couple yards this way, a couple yards that way to achieve a slightly different goal. If he's a good teacher, then that seems like a, a great fit to ultimately have success with the amount of talent they have on offense. Yeah, I think it's going to be especially important if you're going to give Sam Howell a look. And that's like, by all indication, that seems like the way they're going to go with that. So um, I think it's all, it seems like the right fit. I do think, you know, if I was, if I was coach, I'd be looking at some of these guys, um, like the guy out of L.A., the guy out of Miami is very interesting to me. Um, uh, the name escapes me at the moment. Let me check my notes. Uh, Eric, Eric Studesville is Miami. Studesville. Thomas Brown is LA. Yeah, I like the Studesville guy. I like his resume a lot. I've never met the guy. I don't know what he. You know, I know some guys that have worked with him. They speak very highly of him, obviously. So I, I just like I just like a, a younger offensive coordinator. Usually, I think they're more like dialed into kind of the direction the game is going. But that's not to say that. Um, Shermer doesn't do that. You know, obviously he's evolved his offense over the last 15 years in the NFL. So um, that's just my personal preference. But I do think that Shermer seems like the natural fit again. And he has a relationship with Ron. They know each other really well. They work together in Philadelphia. So that seems like the type of guy Ron wants, you know, someone he knows really well, um, someone who's very qualified for the position. He's called plays before. I think all that stuff is is right in line with with the type of candidate that he's looking for. Um, you know, maybe one of these young guys impresses him, but I feel like uh, Schumer's definitely got the inside track for uh, for this. Yeah, and that is an interesting thing, too, to even think about what kind of job it is, right? Like, I know the ownership stuff is hanging over it all, and that's having a huge effect, and, you know, Rivera's uh, instability potentially because of that, and all these factors that make it, and the quarterback, that make it not a good job, potentially, or that are negatives, let's say, on the job. Not that it, because I actually don't think it's a bad job, as I'm about to explain why. No, but yeah. that, that, that would go in the con category if you're doing, like, a pros-cons list. But on the pro side, like, this is a pretty good football team. Um, you know, you're going to have a defense that should be pretty good, again, uh, to, to pair off of you. You've got immense skill position talent. They were one of the last teams to get eliminated from playoff contention. So like they're on the brink of being in the playoffs, they're competitive. And that was with 
the guy that you're hoping to upgrade over, right? Like if you're if you're the incoming OC, you're like maybe I can be the difference to help us win a couple mm-hmm. of extra games. Um, and obviously the quarterback play you're hoping is going to be better uh, because of that. And you know they went. We know what the record was with Wentz versus what it was with Heineke and and all of those things. So I do think this is like when you think of it from Ron's perspective of like, am I hiring a young OC that I want to let develop over a couple of years with a young team? And if we make mistakes, like it's fine. Like, no, he's, he's looking at this as like, who can help me win the most games in 2023? Because if I don't think that way, then I don't know that I'm getting to 2024. And I think that's like an important thing to keep in the back of everyone's head here. No, absolutely. I think the, that time parameter is very, very important. <clears throat> I know there's a lot of guys who, like are very exciting on paper and young opportunities and all the young guys who are looking for to capitalize on an opportunity, all that stuff is true, but you don't have a lot of time here. You don't have a lot of time to kind of mess around. You got to win now. And I think of the guys on the list, I mean, obviously the guy like Daryl Bevel, who's who never got an interview would have been, I think a little bit better, but uh, Shermer's an excellent candidate. And again, I think the relationship Ron has with him, it just, it kind of expedites the process. You know, they have, they've mm-hmm. communicated before they know each other. And, um, and quite frankly, Shermer's like the perfect guy for this job in a weird way, just because it's like, he's not, he doesn't, if it, if it goes a year, if it goes longer than a year, great. If it goes a year, he's probably okay with that. You know, it, it's just like, he's in a perfect spot in his career where this type of job's fine, you know? And yeah. I think, um, and it fits both parties really well. So um, if I had to put my money on anybody, it's Shermer. But yeah. um, you never know. One of these young guys could come in and, and just crush it. And- well, let's look at those two other young guys real quick. And then we'll get to my my name to set the internet on fire. The one that's going to get us a lot of clicks and make a lot of people angry. Um, <laughs> but Eric Studesville has very limited like passing game experience. He's been mostly mm-hmm. a running backs coach. Um, he does have a Rivera connection. I believe they were together in yeah. Chicago. And also, my guy Teresh... Um, tweeted this the other day uh studesville's wife used to play professional basketball and like whatever league it was that was before the WNBA. so this is a long time ago yeah you know who her her head coach was in this league no stephanie rivera really yeah so shout out to to my guy teresh manuel for for that incredible digging it up huh yeah but studesville and rivera know each other and their families know each other so there is that connection there um football wise and and obviously it runs a little bit deeper uh from way back in the day on on the basketball side of things um with that said if mike mcdaniel was willing to keep him like he's obviously a very impressive person uh because mike mike is someone who obviously has a very distinct view of how football should be and if studesville wasn't was enough to keep around um that's that's worthy of consideration um so what what do you think studesville would be as an oc and then we can get to thomas brown from la in just a second well i just like his his like kind of background and again like this is again very biased towards my background he worked for gary kubiak in denver for seven years six years um between 2011 2016 and gary kubiak is like the 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 it's like mike shanahan gary kubiak and then the whole tree comes off of him so he has this west coast you know we just talked about the difference between um schumer kind of marrying concepts um you know studesville is going to marry runs to passes in a way that i'm very familiar with right so not only did he get that kind of base level install from gary kubiak kind of the godfather of kyle shanahan sean mcveigh um, you know, Matt LaFleur, Mike McDaniels, he got kind of a refresher course going to Miami and being there with Mike McDaniels this year and just being around innovative personalities, I think is very advantageous. And so I like kind of where he's been developing in his career and the things that have been around him. And I think that's something that, again, I like. I like this kind of, you know, everyone's talking about how innovative Miami's offense is. I want someone who's at least seen it and been behind the doors and kind of says, okay, this is why we're doing this. And I don't love this necessarily, but we can get to it this way with a different skill position group. So I really dig that about his background. Um, But again, that's because like, I'm comfortable with that. I'm familiar with that. We talked about that on the last podcast, how like your biases influence your decisions pretty dramatically. So that's exciting to me. I like that he's a younger guy. There's something about that. I I think it's because of Sean, honestly, Sean and Kyle, like having dealt with them, I feel like yeah. they can just Sean specifically just found a way to relate to young guys in a really nice way and found a way to teach because he could be like, Hey man, like what's up with this music you're listening to? And it was like, we could chat about it over lunch and we could talk about it and relate it to football. And it was this very cool 
dynamic. And I just feel like as the coaches get older, that the the ability to relate to to the young players coming in it just becomes more and more challenging. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but I do think it um, it can help just kind of align perspectives a little bit. So yeah. Um, but again, for this job, is it the right thing? Uh, um, you know, he he's has a little bit of play calling experience in his background, but not much. And so maybe you want someone who yeah. you know is ready to rock and roll in Shermer. Yeah, he's got, I mean, Studesville is 55. So he's been around for a, a for minute. A um, and he's, I mean, he is like a guy who's very well respected in all the ways you just described, kind of yep. have that younger vibe to him. But it's not like he hasn't been around, right? Like right. he's been coaching in the NFL since 1997. Crazy. He's been coaching in the NFL since before some of his players will be born, uh, if they're draft, you know, the draft picks of this year, um, which is wild. Um, but, you know, <laughs> He's been with the Bears, um, you know. Or actually, I'll just read this off because, like, this is this to me is actually very cool. Um, yeah. The list of guys that he's worked under. Um, it's crazy. It's a crazy yeah, list. Of Jim guys. Fossil, Brian Flores, John Fox, Adam Gase, Dick Jaron, Vance Joseph, Gary Kubiak, Josh McDaniels, Mike McDaniel, Mike Malarkey, Dave Wanstead. So, like, you talk about a variety of experience. Even Josh, McDan yeah. Josh McDaniel, even that is crazy. You know, yeah, like, so that's just some great names in there. Trestle, like, all those guys, man, like, were at peak offenses at some point in their career. Right, and, and but also the experience of working with defensive head coaches. Sure. Like, he's got the, the experience that's really, really fascinating to look at and go, okay, I can see him working here, but the lack of – uh, the lack of play calling experience he, to me is like has, the biggest thing on He has thing done his... it, right? Am I, am I misremembering? I think he's um, done it for a couple of years. He, well, it doesn't have it necessarily written Listen. down. I mean, he was, he was the interim. I mean, this is kind of the wild thing. tells you how long he's been around. Back in 2010, he was the interim uh, head coach when they, they fired the head coach in Denver. Right. So like he's he's definitely been in power positions. Um, I think he did some limiting play, some limited play calling at some point. I think yeah. he helped McDaniel obviously this year. Like he yeah. had the OC title this year, um, so an assistant head coach. So, um, but he's mostly been a running backs coach by position. Mm -hmm. And so um, whether it's a run game coordinator type of thing where he's calling at least the runs or or whatever it may be, um, he's definitely. He's been involved in that process, but it's different when you're the guy. It's different when you're in the quarterback's helmet and like you're doing no, absolutely. all that all that stuff. All right. Last guy we want to look at uh of the guys that we're gonna interview this week is Thomas Brown. Um Thomas Brown is a hot name, kind of the latest guy to come out of the Rams Sean McVay coaching tree. Um he was the assistant head coach this year. He's also the tight ends coach. We love a tight ends coach yeah, uh, to do. move into a, a play calling position, uh, especially an OC position, um, because as we talked about with with your background and your ability to to talk about football from the experience of teaching blocking schemes, teaching pass game stuff, like tight end is the position where it all comes together. So I'm always intrigued, but definitely does not have the play calling experience that yeah. um, you know that Shermer has. And has not been in the NFL for nearly as long. So a lot of his experience also goes back to college. Like he was a running backs coach uh, before he got to LA for the University of South Carolina and mm -hmm. University of Miami, and like had you know was at University of Georgia. Like a lot of college experience uh, going back to like 2011, uh, and then 2020 through 2022, he's with the Rams. So he's been in a great system. He's worked with Kevin O'Connell. He's worked with Sean McVay. He's worked mm -hmm. with all these guys. But it, it's definitely a very different resume than the other two. Yeah, and he seems like a guy who would do well in like a mentorship position calling plays. Kind of like Sean did here with Jay and then, you know, um, Sean did with, um, gosh, the guy in Minnesota now. With Kevin, yeah. With Kevin, yeah. Like, so obviously, I, I think that he's, he seems like a really great candidate, you know. And like you talk about tight end, let's talk about tight end coaches who make good OCs for a second. Because like right now, there's a whole bunch of them. There's... Frank Smith down in Miami, he's helping out with like, I think he's a passing game coordinator. Then there's Wes Phillips, who I played for up in Minnesota with Kevin. And then Sean, obviously, was a tight end coach to kind of start his career. And the thing that's advantageous about it is you have to know everything with a very high level of detail. So like a running back coach, you're going to know protections, you're going to know run scheme really, really well. But because of the kind of routes the backs run, usually you don't have to kind of delve into the details of the passing game. And then offensive line coaches, we're going to talk about this in a minute with your with your sleeper candidate. Yeah. Um, they know protections better than anybody on the team. They know run schemes better than anybody on the team, but they lose a little bit of the pass game. A tight ends coach, and the receivers coach is the same thing, but the other way. They know the pass game really well. 
but they don't know the protections. They don't know the run scheme. A tight end coach has to know everything at a very, very high level because the tight end has to play all the positions. And I think that's why you get some of these guys from a tight end background who are so well versed in their stuff. Now, again, I don't know if this guy's the right kind of candidate, like his experience. It's, it's really hard to know unless you know somebody who knows him. It's really hard to kind of get a bead on it. Um, but I do like that he is a tight end coach. I like tight end coaches. I like quarterback coaches because for the reasons I just described, they have to really know the offense. And um, I'm, I'm sure he does. Obviously, like he's got the assistant head coach title. So Sean or somebody in that building thinks very, very highly of him. They didn't want him to leave. So I think that bodes well in terms of his pedigree and how people think of him. But he does feel like it's the wrong guy for this job. I think you want someone with a little bit more experience, who's been around the block a little bit more, who can resonate with this. And I think if you just look at look at Scott, <clears throat> right? Scott was a first-time play caller. And I think if I'm Ron, I want to steer away from that as much as I can, especially given the year parameter. You know, I think that's something that is um, would, would kind of steer me away from, from Brown. Thanks for watching this clip of Take Command. First, why don't you why don't you like it? It lets other people know that it was good, and then they should watch it too. And Logan, we have a new exclusive home for full episodes. We do. 1067 The Fans YouTube page. Go check it out and please subscribe. Yeah, do do what Logan said. Do He's it. Very, very smart. <laughs> <laughs>